Revolution, reaction, and reform can have several different outcomes and consequences as illustrated in the differences between the countries of Ukraine and Russia within the dissolution of the USSR. In the year 1985, the USSR's economy was stagnant and beginning to decline. The new General Secretary, Mikhail Gorbachev, realized this and promised to move the USSR into a new era. He stated that the economy was stalled and in need of reorganization. He also promised rapid modernization and increased industrial and agricultural prosperity. By 1986, he realized the ignorance most Soviet officials basked in. Almost none of the elected officials would recognize the severity of the problems the USSR faced. This set in motion the events to come. Gorbachev realized the first problem the USSR needed to face was the separation of the common people from the government. He therefore implemented his famous program called Glasnost, which was a series of structured public debates that allowed government officials and citizens to examine their problems. While this was still controlled by the central government, it was still more freedom than previously allowed. However, some people were still wary of Gorbachev. Gorbachev needed to generate more approval for Glasnost, so he instructed several editors to have their publications support the program and start generating approval for the USSR and the common people. This wasn't enough, however, as Gorbachev needed a solid core of Russian supporters if he was to take on the Politburo. There was a core of people who called themselves Children of the 20th Congress. These people were supporters of Khrushchev and his reforms. Gorbachev knew what he had to do to obtain their support. He identified himself publicly as a child of the 20th Congress. This won their support and allowed Gorbachev to make even further, more drastic reforms. In June 1987, Gorbachev appeared before the Politburo. He said the over-centralized methods of the USSR had to be abandoned. Small-scale private industry would be allowed, and industry managers would be allowed to decide what to produce after meeting state set requirements. Gorbachev was able to force this through by claiming the USSR was in a pre-crisis state and on the verge of collapsing. In November of 1987, Gorbachev released his book Perestroika. In it, he slandered Stalin's rule, something that had never before been allowed, and over-idolized Lenin. After all these reforms, Gorbachev still claimed he wasn't modeling the USSR after Western countries, but rather he was making a model for the Western countries to follow. Meanwhile in Ukraine, the 1980s were taking their toll on the people more severely than the people in Russia. No one could make their ends meet. There was no money and too much regulation and production of goods. By the time Gorbachev reached office, many Ukrainians, especially those in the West, were jubilant when Gladnos was enacted in 1986. Its effect on the health of the overall Ukrainian economy, however, was marginal. On top of the economy, in late April of 1986, the Chernobyl disaster shocked the world. The world looked at Ukraine and formed their opinions on the USSR from their observations. Knowing this would happen, the Communist Party covered up knowledge of the event for several days. Many people were killed by radiation poisoning and the complete oversight by managers of the plant. To the west from the plant, the people of Lviv used Chernobyl as a way to use Glasnost to gain more political concessions. The Soviet Union had never caved to the pressure of just one city, but by 1987, economic issues became too exacerbated. Something needed to be done. When Gorbachev introduced more economic reforms in the Politburo in 1987, along with Perestroika, Ukrainians started building coal mines and adding more industries. The resulting rush made the select few who were already wealthy incredibly more so. Something that was forbidden in years past was now allowed. Moreover, the city of Lviv started forming opposition groups to the Politburo in Kiev. Although weak, their mere existence went in the face of decades of Soviet rule. Ukrainians even began criticizing Soviet history. Such controversial topics were never allowed even six years prior. But with Gorbachev in Moscow and the opposition in Lviv, Ukrainians were now changing how the game was played. It depends uh, on uh, the ability of people to accept new things and um, maybe to change their minds because they just got used to think in such a way that Stalin was a hero and the USSR was a great country and when it collapsed, uh, we just, they didn't get anything better than that. As the 90s came into the picture, the people of the USSR, specifically Russia, were calling for even more freedoms and allowances. However, in August of 1991, a military coup d'etat rose up in Russia to overthrow Gorbachev and reverse his reforms. Fortunately, the rebellion was unsuccessful due to political backlash. Ironically for the rebels, the Russian people began fearing a reversal of Gorbachev's reforms and demanded outright secession. On December 22, 1991, 
Russia became the first state to secede from the USSR. This spelled out the death of the Republic, as Russia supplied 51% of the population and over 60% of the GDP. As such, when Gorbachev officially resigned from his position and officially dissolved the Union on December 25th, Russia took the place of the USSR in the NATO Security Council and also assumed command of all the nuclear warheads. Boris Yeltsin, a Gorbachev supporter, by this time had been elected President of Russia in the first free direct election in Russian history. Yeltsin was a radical of the time and favored the capitalist system. Yeltsin had plans for the new free Russia. He called his plan shock therapy, meaning the reforms would be drastic enough to quickly reverse Russia's old way of doing things. However, such a massive change had unforeseen consequences. Hyperinflation ensued and welfare was cut. This led to a higher poverty rate and lower general health of the Russian people. Still, Yeltsin defended his plan by saying the government needed to stabilize its budget, then it could guide the economy to recovery. Today, this process is still in effect, and economically Russia is beginning to recover. Over the course of Putin's presidency, the GDP grew on average 6.7% per year, and the average income increased around 11% annually. The government even had a positive budget, which resulted from a 70% cut of external debt. Will their economy continue to grow? Hopefully, the youth of the country can continue the economic success. In Ukraine, things did not improve beyond the levels of the late 80s, and by 1990, the people of Ukraine were becoming disgruntled with Russian leadership. Gorbachev had always been a man who had promised major reforms, and although many of the reforms had drastically changed life in Ukraine, things weren't improving. By 1991, there had been enough changes to have elected a few opposition leaders into the Ukrainian Politburo, and events in Russia were pushing the leaders in Kiev further and further away from Moscow. After the failed August coup, Ukrainian passed the Declaration of Independence of Ukraine, and the USSR was officially dissolved by Christmas of that year. However, lingering questions remain. The people had voted overwhelmingly for independence, but as is the case throughout Ukrainian history, the East did not see eye to eye with the West, and lingering questions remained on how Ukraine should set up its government and its economy. Western analysts predicted Ukraine would be far better in the 90s than other former Soviet republics, and even in some cases Russia. However, the government set up in 1991 was criminally corrupt and lacked any real regulation and structure. As a result, the country's economy throughout the 1990s regressed and inflation ensued until 1996 when the government introduced a new currency. As the Simpoko family put it, uh, 90s were complicated to say the least and actually you are right, my granny really had to go to Poland and to Russia, you know, just to sell something, to get some money because uh, salaries were, were not paid and um, you know, our government just cut on all uh, social programs and uh, didn't um, pay salaries, maybe, uh, probably because it was a very difficult economical situation. And uh, um, I think probably, uh, of course, we could avoid it, because somehow um, Lithuania and Estonia, they didn't experience uh, such a terrible time as we did. And um, I think, uh, of course, 90s were uh, complicated, but at the same time, they were maybe, they were like a challenge for Ukraine. If Ukraine, um, it, it, they just showed uh, if, um, that Ukraine was able to uh, exist as an independent country without Russia. Of course, it was bad, it was terrible, but it was alive. With the dramatic shift in national politics in such a short time frame, the Ukrainian youth had become more and more independent in comparison to their parents. They started the Orange Revolution of 2004 and are actively criticizing the government's corruption and voter fraud. A majority of Ukrainians wish to see their country lose independence on Russian oil imports and join the European Union. However, with such rampant governmental fraud, it's not likely to happen soon. So what's next for Ukraine? It's what the younger generation does with it. And that's what it boils down in both countries today. In the past, the people were not taught to think for themselves or to be fiercely independent. Without these traits, the democratic reforms post-revolutions were difficult and tumultuous. But with the independence of the 90s came a generation of individuals willing to make the transition to democracy work better than it has before. It has been shown with the Russian Spring of 2012 and the Orange Revolution of 2004 that both countries have a youth willing to alter their country for the better.